resistance in, in the fall, I think, in October. And so this is called the German Democratic Republic. Uh, there's only only one word of the three that is actually true. It, it's German. It was neither democratic nor was it a republic. It, it became a dictatorship, uh, you know, run by the Communist Party with a few bloc parties that were like, that had communists embedded in them. You know, it was just a for show. As a matter of fact, the elections were always rigged. And uh, when I went, came back to Germany many, many years later, when I re-entered, a lot of my, uh, my friends, same age people, they were, were not able to shed the, the uh, remnants of their brainwashing. And I, I heard this a lot. You know, we had a good cause. We, the reason that it failed was we had the wrong people at the top. First, I, I spent um, two and a half years of training in Berlin. The two and a half years was supposedly enough to pre of preparation to launch, launch me into uh, West Germany as, you know, as an illegal. You know, it makes sense, right? language is the same, culture is the same. Uh, now, it's interesting, this is a little byline here. Uh, I, I believe that the, the KGB and the Stasi didn't trust each other at all, because the Stasi had about a thousand people in West Germany, some of them in high level at the government. Why did the Stasi, if the KGB send somebody like me? Doesn't make any sense, right? But they, they didn't trust each other. Uh, so I was told that every every agent, every KGB agent who operates outside, whether they are under diplomatic cover uh, or, or some other cover or illegal like me, uh, they need to uh, learn another language. Okay, so and I had the choice. I picked English, and then one day uh, we we had a visitor. Uh, in Berlin, from, from Moscow, from the center, and he asked me, so how's your English going? And I pu pu pulled a novel out, and I said, I can read that without uh, without a dictionary. That was maybe eight, nine months after I started. So they flew me to Moscow, and I, had, I was interviewed by two ladies. One was a born American. They were asked, literally, can this man learn English well enough so he could be uh, introduced into the U.S. as a quote-unquote born American. That means, you know, can he be fundamentally accent-free or have just a little bit of an accent? And the American was typical as American optimistic. She said, yeah, I can teach him. And somebody like me was an absolute rarity. Russians uh, have a hard time getting rid of their accent. I think you, you know Poles are the same way, right? So that's why they started looking for people in, in the Baltic states as well as in Germany. Most of the time, the KGB smuggled illegals into the U.S. through third countries, uh, primarily uh, Brazil. Canada was the was the other way to come in. So, but but I was I was considered. Now they decided potentially the crown jewel of all illegals, and I don't know if I, however many uh, had that ability. I just know that they only trained 10 of us in the, in the late 70s to mid 80s. That's, that's it's information that came out of the KGB archives. That's bona fide, not nobody made that up. So, uh, so and that's how they moved me to Moscow where I worked with this uh, American lady. I met her twice a week. And eventually I'll, I also uh, was trained by two very famous uh, KGB agents uh, uh, and uh, eventually, after a practice trip to uh, Canada, I was ready. Uh, my destination was New York, and if, the, if there's a little bit of an accent, nobody in New York, in New York gives a damn. And that was, so in 1978, I, I showed up uh, in Chicago, O'Hare. Within two days, I was Jack Barsky. I, uh, a certified birth certificate of Jack Barsky who had passed away as a young person. He was 11 years old and there was most likely no record anywhere of his existence. So that
that's how I got here. So you were operational in the U.S. for 10 years. Yep. The KGB was very good at keeping secrets compared to American intelligence. It always leaks. Uh, they had their roots in illegal underground where they had these small little groups of three or four people and uh, there was only one person that connected with another group. So they were very good at compartmentalizing. And when I signed up, I became a state secret. Okay? But Obverse was also true. They kept a lot of stuff secret from me because he got forbid if I defect, you know, I shouldn't know anything. I didn't know the name of my boss. They shared with me only what they thought I need to know to do my job. Well, buddy, you can't do that for somebody who has to make his own decisions all the time. And so I made some, some lousy decisions. The one thing that they didn't tell me was what what the real value of my presence in the U.S. was. And the real value, again, the real value of my being in the United States was my being in the United States. But in the late 80s, uh, there, there was a, an intelligence war going on. The CIA and, and, and the KGB, they had an, an open competition. And, and most, most of the agents in both countries, from both countries, were under diplomatic cover. And they were suspected to do spying, and if they were uh, they, if they uh, were found out, they would be expelled. Well, and then the other side would just count them and expel one of the American agents, and back and forth. And some, sometimes it was a group of three or four, and so the other side expelled three or four. Uh, Andropov, the head of the KGB at the time, was very concerned that diplomatic. Uh, the uh, relations would be broken up altogether. Why? You know, you, know, you put together the dots. In those days, uh, the most valuable agents for the KGB in the United States were moles. Aldrich Ames in the CIA and, and uh, Robert Hansen in the FBI. They shared a treasure trove of secrets. They did a lot of damage to the United States. And they interacted with... And you got the moles here agents. now. God forbid all the diplomats are gone. It's only us left, the, the illegals. You think they told me that? Did there were any instructions, anything? Nothing. I found out much, much later. So, and uh, this is a friend of mine who, who ran counterintelligence uh, in, uh, uh, for the FBI when, when he... Uh, um, it was already against Russia, and, and he told me he knows quite a bit about illegals, and he said, I was the only illegal where he has knowledge that I had uh, tasks, like my friend, did, uh, the, the other German. Well, well, this task was to just live like an American, and he, he did IT at, at Columbia University, no other task. I had a number of tasks, uh, and, and they... They focused me on foreign policy, <laughs> you know, to get close to foreign policy decision makers or, or at least people, uh, individuals that uh, influence foreign policy, like think tanks and so forth. I failed completely with that because I wasn't, I wasn't situated in society to befriend people like that. You know, like, you know, initially I, I started my my first job was bike messenger, and then. Then I became a college student. You know, I just didn't have a good reason to mingle with people like that. And, and with that, I could have had some success, but they never told me wh whether I did. They never even said, in general, good job. Uh, I function as a spotter, look for candidates that could be recruited. Primarily, I focused on students when I was in college, people who might wind up in government, and also people who uh, have weaknesses, or, uh, or followers of a very radical ideology, whatever that was. It, it could be, it, it wouldn't be communism. The, the communism in those days was not really popular, but it, uh, it could, could, could have been uh, like anti-Semitism or something. So you recruit on the false flag. We're going to take a quick break right now, and we'll be right back. 